Hello, my name is Kelly White, and I am the Clare County Office of Education. Thank you for joining me today as we explore Universal Design for Learning, or UDL, in an early learning environment. Please note that there is a Padlet available to you. You may access the Padlet via the posted link or by using the camera on a smartphone or tablet to access the QR code in the bottom right-hand corner. On the Padlet, you will find a copy of this slide deck and all accompanying resources. Today, participants will increase their understanding of Universal Design for Learning, or UDL, and participants will take that understanding and increase it to see how exactly UDL can support early learners. As we apply the UDL principles, please note that as we explore today's presentation, you are encouraged to self-regulate in a way that's meaningful to you. Find a comfortable spot, take care of your bio needs, etc. Please perceive the information in a way that best suits you. Feel free to just listen, access and interact with the slide deck and Padlet as the presentation moves along, etc. And finally, on the app. Take notes in a way that is meaningful to you. Begin to create action items for yourself. Think about how you will use this information with your colleagues, etc. So what is universal design for learning? UDL is a framework, not a curriculum, and it's rooted in neuroscience, the learning sciences, and architecture. Its goal is to identify and remove barriers and design for learner, learner variability so that all learners may become expert learners. Here you see three designs that were intended to be universal or accessible to everyone. Take a minute and study each one. Can you identify any potential barriers? Let's start with the computer mouse in the top left-hand corner. This is marketed as a universal mouse. See any potential barriers? What if you are left-handed? Let's look at the game controller. Do you see any potential barriers here? This game controller requires the use of two hands including two thumbs for the smaller joysticks near the bottom. What if someone is without all 10 digits or two arms? And what about the playground swing? It's a simple design and one that the majority of the population takes for granted as a childhood rite of passage. Do you see any potential barriers in this design? Think about what is required to operate a simple piece of playground equipment. Two arms, two legs, and core muscles. Now, let's look at these three designs. These three designs were all intended for a specific audience in their original conception. However, in their final design products, all have benefits for the greater good. The curb cut in the top left corner was originally designed under IDEA for those who had a barrier in navigating the elevation change between the curb and the street. This simple curb cut design has made that elevation change accessible to people pushing strollers and bike riders as well, and the texture change in the curb cut has added accessibility to the visually impaired. The closed caption in the top right-hand corner. Closed captions were originally designed to support the deaf and hard of hearing community. However, closed captions also offer supports to language learners, to people at the gym, and to spouses with different bedtimes. Spouses with different bedtimes are actually the largest consumption group for using closed captioning. And finally, the design at the bottom of the screen is an example of a wheelchair accessible ramp. However, this design offers more than just wheelchair accessibility. 
It can be accessed by strollers and bicycles. People can also sit and enjoy the space, etc. Universal design works under the concept of if it can be good for some, it can be best for all. I mentioned that UDL had roots in neuroscience. Cognitive neuroscience has been able to begin mapping the brain and observing brain function using various imaging technologies. What we now know is that there are three groups of neutral, excuse me, of neural networks that drive learning. First, at the top left, is the effective networks. These are activated by perceiving the why of learning. It's our emotional connection to the learning. We need a reason to learn. The learning has to have some sort of value, especially if we are to sustain effort and persist through challenges. Second, at the top right, we have the cognition networks. They figure out the what of learning. These networks take in information from the senses, process it in working memory, and store that information in long-term memory for later use. So your memory centers, visual, audio processing are all in the, the rec recognition networks. Finally, at the bottom center, we have the strategic network. These networks drive the how of learning. These are our get things done processes responsible for focusing attention, communicating and creating, and strategic thinking. At first glance, one might think that these networks act in sequence. We get engaged, are effective. We take on new information, recognition, and then we do something with that learning, strategic. Though that may be a logical sequence, the truth is that these networks are interacting with each other all of the time. In order to be interested in learning, I have to perceive something and then judge its worthiness of my attention. I then need to sustain that interest, process new learning, and maintain focus rather than shifting to another task. Like fingerprints, no two brains are the same, and the average learner doesn't exist. Variability of learners should be considered when designing a learner learning environment and experience. Environments and experiences should be flexible and ensure sensory, physical, and cognitive variability. The beautiful part of learner variability is that it's predictable, and what we can predict we can plan for. Let's further explore variability. Here we see friends gathered for a dinner party. As anyone knows who has hosted a dinner party, there's a lot of planning and prepping that goes into creating a meaningful experience for everyone. So what if after all of your labors, your, your guests begin to throw these comments at you? Your meal and all of your hard work that went into planning it is no longer accessible to everyone. Now we have barriers. But what if at the next dinner party, you serve a buffet or deconstructed meal, something that offered choice? It takes the same amount of planning and prepping on the part of the host, but now the meal is accessible to a greater number as the participants have choice in their options. Options give learners choice. Choice gives learners agency, and agency breeds expert learning. Expert learning is the ultimate goal of universal design learning. UDL is a lens, not a checklist, let alone a curriculum. It's a way of looking at our learning environment and laying out flexible paths to firm goals. Some folks encounter the guidelines and think, oh my gosh, how am I supposed to do all of these things all of the time? Actually, the guidelines are tools to help us apply the lens. They show us common points where variability manifests. Remember, it's a marathon, not a sprint. That's key for us to set expectations for ourselves and others. 
No one should feel like they're going to anticipate and address every barrier overnight. It's about taking a first step and then another. A slow, steady progression. You're going to need to pace yourself. While marathons have finish lines, UDL, like all worthy pursuits, do not. You're never done. To keep progressing, you need a vision. And the guidelines and other rubrics can form that vision. And you need to have deliberate practice. Many of you have heard the notion that it takes 10,000 hours to achieve mastery. Well, two things to remember about that. Those have to be 10,000 hours of deliberate practice, not 5,000 of building competency, and another 5,000 on cruise control. And second, a master in any field is likely to give you a list of how he or she can improve even further. And finally, it's important to know that it's not standards-based, but standardized. UDL is in all of our state frameworks, and it's the only framework in ESSA. It's not everybody does what they want, but it's also not one size fits all. In UDL, we like to say firm goals, flexible means. This is the UDL framework. It's intended to be fluid, while it's breaking up, broken up excuse me, into both columns and rows, there is fluidity amongst both. Across the top, you'll see our networks, the engagement, representation, action, and expression. That is the why, the what, and the how of learning. We refer to these as three principles of UDL. When you take each of the columns, you now have guidelines. So for engagement, we have recruiting interests, sustaining effort and persistence, self-regulation. Within the guidelines, you're going to find checkpoints. The checkpoints are ways to check your design to see that you have met a particular area, such as physical action, expression and communication, or executive functions. Down at the bottom, you'll find the goal. This is where we capture expert learners. So expert learners are purposeful and, and motivated, resourceful, knowledgeable, strategic, and goal-directed. Horizontally, the guidelines are organized into three rows. The first row being the access row. This includes the guidelines that suggest ways to increase access to learning by recruiting interest and by offering options for perception and physical action. In early learning, the best way to do this is to incorporate as many of the five senses as possible and as often as possible. The middle row is the build row. This includes the guidelines that suggest ways to develop effort, persistence, language and symbols, and expression and communication. This is where kids are starting to take their background knowledge and build upon it. And then the bottom row we have internalized. This row includes the guidelines that suggest ways to empower learners through self-regulation, comprehension, and executive functioning. This is where the kiddos begin to take what they have learned and put it into their own words and can truly explain to you what it is or what their understanding is of what they have learned. This is where we're taking the information from the short-term memory to the long-term memory and we're creating new dendrites in the brain. We want to get our students to the goal of being expert learners, and the guidelines are there to help us. Vertically, the guidelines are organized into those three principles, engagement, representation, action, and expression. You'll also notice that they're color-coded. Everything that falls under engagement is green, representation purple, action and expression, blue. 
as I mentioned, these are fluid. So while you are planning, you may say, oh, I really feel this fall under action and expression. But it could also be engagement. Do not spend a lot of time in the self-debate. Both are probably correct. The UDL frameworks offer an overarching approach to designing meaningful learning opportunities that address that learner variability and suggest purposeful, proactive attention to the designs of the goals, assessments, methods, and materials. We set clear, regular, reg we set clear rigorous goals, anticipate any barriers that our students might face in their learning environments, and design options for flexible learning environments that meet the needs of all of our students. UDL is not about lowering expectations. It's about clarifying them. And in order to do that, you must start with clear, concise goals. We need to anticipate the barriers so that we can design for them. What is it that we anticipate students will find have will find difficulties? Is there any way that we can prevent this problem from occurring? When we design to address the barriers, we increase engagement options, representation options, and action and expression options. So let's start to apply this to early learning. If our goal is for students to begin to recognize aspects of farm life, how can teachers design with UDL in mind? So we're looking at our engagement, our representation, and our action and expression. Now it's important to note that this lesson plan, while it is absolutely adorable, is not necessarily designed with UDL in mind. So we're gonna to add, add some of those layers to it. So if we were to lift just the, the literacy component of this farm lesson plan, we could increase representation by incorporating felt board pieces and or interactive storybooks throughout circle time and at the literacy station or center to increase both levels of representation as well as engagement. To further increase access and supports and deepen the relationship, or excuse me, deepen the rep representation, students could access an audible version of the story or the animal sounds referenced in the book. If the students had multiple access points to the story, then there are opportunities to recruit interest, sustain effort, and build persistence and practice regulation all in place, which in turn addresses the potential for unwanted barriers, or excuse me, unwanted behaviors in the classroom to the boredom and or frustration. To further deepen the action and expression, students could take the chicken and egg letter matching and turn it into a game. Let's look at layering universal design for learning on another aspect of this farm lesson. Our learning goal remains the same. Students will be able to demonstrate their understanding of farm life or aspects of a farm. So how can we deepen the creativity aspect of this lesson? As a way to increase engagement by recruiting interest and sustaining efforts and persistence, Students could be greeted at the door of the classroom by various animal tracks on the ground. Then, as the lessons unfold, students will be able to build their perception, their language, and their comprehension around the tracks that greeted them at the door and originally piqued their interest, allowing students fluidity from access to build to internalize. Students can collaboratively work together to build new tracks using multiple medias and even perhaps exploring other types of tracks. Tire tread tracks, tire tread from cars, hand prints, finger prints, walk prints, etc. Allowing for a challenge aspect of a lesson. And varying mediums in which students explore making 
also allows for a deeper dive in both representation as well as action and expression. And lastly, if we lift the STEM portion of this lesson, we can increase the representation by allowing for pictorials of the positional phrases with a variety of farm pictures. We can have the students explore positional phrases in a variety of languages, thus deepening their connection. Again, we can gamify positional phrases and we can have students identify the positional phrases in all of the multiple medias around the classroom. Students at any grade level don't want to wait for feedback, especially in our new digital platforms. In order for feedback to be meaningful, it needs to be timely and it needs to be often and frequent. So in order for feedback to be informative, it needs to be specific. Keep it aligned to the learning goal. Be sure to be assessing and providing feedback on the content of the knowledge or learning, rather than the means in which the student is delivering their knowledge and learning. UDL has taught us that it's the environment, not the students that need to change. I love this quote and graphic because it truly speaks to the fact that we get the students that we get, and we're not going to be able to change said students. That is out of the locus of our control. However, the environment in which the students are greeted by and participating in is within the locus of our control. We can change the environment. So if we are, are designing the environment with as limited barriers as possible, then the students will be able to reach their maximum potential. UDL can also be applied in a distance learning format. You want to make sure that there is flexibility in the methods, which is the way students engage in the learning, the materials, the way in which students access the learning, and in the assessment, which is how students show their understanding of what they've learned. So when you're designing for less lessons in a distance learning format, you can still honor these three flexibilities. There is a trickle-down theory in education. And it often begins in higher ed. It's where the higher ed teachers or professors blame the high school teachers for the learning gaps that they see in their students. High school teachers then in turn blame middle school teachers and middle school teachers point, point fingers at elementary school teachers, who then tend to attribute the learning gaps to the grade level previous to them until you get to kindergarten. And then kindergarten points to preschool teachers or the lack of preschool altogether. And finally, the preschool teacher te tends to blame the parent or caregiver. While this is an ugly truth within our educational system, it is a trend that can be stopped. If universal design for learning was applied as early as preschool, then the students would enter the K-12 system with a stronger sense of school readiness, as the students would be able to better promote self-regulation because they have had opportunities for multiple means of action and expression. They have had greater opportunity to move the information from short-term to long-term memory, giving them vast background knowledge. UDL in early learning would allow for opportunities to promote perseverance and self-agency for their promoting school readiness. And students who have experienced UDL in early learning have had supports and challenge opportunities built into the design of their learning. So they leave the early learning setting with a deep exploration and understanding of both themselves as a learner as well as the content they have covered. In closing, I hope that you leave this webinar today 
with a deeper understanding of the needs for methods, materials, and assessments to be flexible. But you remember that the average learner does not exist. It is a myth. Therefore, you need to design to the edges. Keep in mind the good for some, best for all example of the curb cut. Both learning and universal design for learning are a journey, not a destination. Be kind to yourself, start small, and remember it is nearly impossible to hit every checkpoint in every lesson. And lastly, remember parents are sending you the best version of their child every day. We cannot change the child, but we can change the environment. When the learning environment is more engaging and more accessible, you will see a decline in behaviors. So by now, we should have an increased understanding of Universal Design for Learning, or UDL, and we should be able to see the connection between UDL and how it can go about supporting early learning. Dear teacher, I know it doesn't always seem like it, but I really do want to listen and learn. It's just my brain is kind of different. So this is what I'd like you to know about me. I have to move, or I really can't pay attention. Even though I'm not looking at you, I can still listen to what you're saying. If you tell me, sit up straight, now I have to use all of my brain to do just that. It makes me feel sad when you tell me to try harder, even though I've already tried as hard as I can. I actually listen better when I'm rocking in my chair. When you give me a bunch of directions, I start to think, I will never remember all of this. Sometimes my mom or dad ends up doing all of my homework. So here's how you could maybe help. Let me get up and move while I'm learning. Let me look wherever I want when you talk to me. Let me rock or slouch in my chair. No matter what, please don't take away my recess. Give me hope I could do all by myself. Make directions very short. Just ask me, what does your brain need right now? And one more thing. My brain might be different than yours, but it's still amazing. Sincerely, your student. Your student. Your student. Your student. So I leave you with the video because out of the mouth of babes comes the real truth. Remember to keep your methods, your means, and your assessments flexible. Remember that it is a, a journey. It's not about the destination. And know that we are here to answer questions that you may have and or offer any kind of support. So thank you for joining me today. Best of luck in your UDL journey.